What's up, students? We are so glad that you have joined us because we've been in the middle of an amazing series called A Different Way. We've been taking the whole year to look at the lifestyle of Jesus, how Jesus lived his everyday life. Because Jesus, he came as the Son of God and to be our Savior, but more than that, he came to show us what it means to be human to be fully alive, a fully alive man or woman, boy or girl in a relationship with God. And this week, as we look at the lifestyle of Jesus, we learned that Jesus had arranged his life around the practice of fasting. So, so what do we mean when we talk about fasting? Well, let's check this out. You say, okay, so then what is fasting? Fasting is just simply abstaining from food to seek God. It's choosing to say, I don't want to hunger and thirst for the things of this world. I want to hunger and thirst for God. I want to bring my flesh into submission to my spirit. I want to deny myself the things of this world so I can make room for the things of God. Fasting is simply fasting from food to feast on God. Like when I choose to fast from this cheeseburger, I'm practicing denying my flesh in the here and now so that I can deny my anger then and there. But when I fast this lunch, what I'm doing is practicing denying myself, not doing what I want to do, so that I can deny my flesh with that lust later. When I fast for a day, what I'm doing is I'm choosing to deny myself, choosing what is good over what I want, so that I can choose to deny my pride later. Because what we've been talking about in this whole series is if you want to do the things that Jesus did, you have to do the things that Jesus did. If I want to do what he did on the spot, I have to do what he did behind the scenes. The problem is, is we get on the spot and are convinced we're just going to be able to deny our anger. Oh, I don't get angry. I'm just going to deny my lust. I'm just going to deny that pride. Oh, I, I just, I will deny the control, the judgment, the resentment, the bitterness, the, the frustration, the, the, the anxiety, the depression, the worry, the fear. Like I'll just, I'll just deny it. How's that working for you? In fact, this is why Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Here's a great question for you. How do you practice denying yourself? If one of the conditions of actually following him to actually do it, not talk about it, but actually do it is denying ourselves and picking up our cross. How do you practice that? I don't know how you practice denying yourself in the area of obedience and holiness and purity and fear of the Lord and submission and surrender and his will, not your will, without first practicing denying your flesh in the area of food, something I can take authority over to practice saying no to what I want so I can say yes to what is good. Does this make sense? Think of all the desires, the needs, the wants, the comforts, the compulsions, the appetites that we spend our whole life satisfying. It's like I desire it, so I go get it. I, I want it, so I take it. I have an appetite for it, so I satisfy that craving. I have a compulsion, so I fulfill that compulsion. I have a comfort, I will get that need met. It's like so much of our life is actually arranged around satisfying the cravings of the flesh. But think of how much of your life has revolved around satisfying the cravings of your flesh. Wants, needs, compulsions, desires, comforts, and we go and we satisfy those things. In fact, if you can actually catch it, think of how much you use food to comfort and numb and cope the deep pain of your life. I satisfy my flesh with quick comfort to cover up the deep pain of my soul. In fact, when we talk about our obsession with food and our overeating, did you ever just stop for a moment and think the reason we do that is because we're led by the flesh, not by the spirit? And the flesh is loud and demanding and controlling and the flesh will not stop screaming in your ear until it gets what it wants or until it's crucified. It's only two options. 
I mean, look at what John says. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Cravings of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's the three categories that all sin falls in from Genesis to Revelation. It's the same human struggle we've had from the beginning. And if you go all the way back to Eve in the garden, here's the problem. The problem is Eve was fasting from God and feasting on the world. She was told to not eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says, when she saw that the food was good for eating, cravings of the flesh, appealing to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom, the pride of life, she took it and she ate it. Instead of fasting from the world and feasting on God, she fasted from God and feasted on the world. And here we all are. Now, what's amazing is when Jesus is tempted by the devil three times in the desert, it's the same three temptations. Tell these stones to become bread, cravings of the flesh. I will show you all the kingdoms of the world, and if you bow down, I'll give them to me, lust of the eyes. And he takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple and says, throw yourself off and the angels will catch you. In other words, do something spectacular to put yourself in the middle of all of it. Pride. But because Jesus was fasting from the flesh and feasting on God, He had victory. Maybe we would have more victory of temptation in our life if we would practice fasting from the world, fasting our flesh in order to feast on God. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. He says there's the flesh and there's the spirit and they are in conflict with one another. Uh, You can't walk in the flesh and the spirit at the same time. They're, they're, They're in competition with another. The flesh is loud, aggressive, demanding and bossing and the spirit is patient and gentle and kind. The flesh will always demand to be satisfied the Holy Spirit will always peacefully stand by until you're interested in him. And I love that it says those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. In other words, we have to choose to allow our flesh to be crucified and we have to participate in that. Now, the interesting thing about it is it's you choosing your will. Jesus was not forced by the father to go to the cross. Whenever the Bible talks about the cross and crucifixion, there is no forcing. It's always a choosing of the will. Do I want to crucify so I can be resurrected? And what's interesting about being crucified is you don't have enough hands to actually pull it off. Okay. What is that a picture of? That I have to do my part and say, I will this. Holy Spirit, I open myself up to this. I want to practice denying my flesh, but I need you to help me fully be crucified that I might live the new life I have in Christ. See, your flesh will either be satisfied or crucified. There's no in between. Your flesh every day is either more satisfied or more crucified. It's either dying or it's actually strengthening. And we get the choice of whether or not we're feeding it or partnering with the Holy Spirit to crucify. And that's why he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. He's going back to the finished work of Jesus. You're now in the spirit. Now live according to this new reality. You used to live in the flesh. The flesh was all you could do, but now you're in the spirit. So now walk in the spirit. And if you actually catch it, the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's not a work of the flesh. It's a work of the spirit. So I can't even control my own compulsions to the flesh. What I can do is open myself up and say, I want to take off the old self and put on the new self. Holy spirit, I need you to help me. And the problem for a lot of us is we start saying things like this. Yes, I don't do the things I want to do. We say, that's just my personality. That's just my Enneagram number. I I mean, I'm just, I'm just an eight. This is just how eights act. I'm an eight. That's just how eights act, right? No, that's just called uncrucified flesh. And when that flesh gets crucified, you will now walk in the character of the spirit. Or how about this one that says in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, 
but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, your body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body as instruments of righteousness for sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. I mean, mind blowing verse, but just you're dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. So don't let sin reign, have the highest influence in your body. Why? Because you've spent so much time in the past offering the parts of your body as instruments of wickedness. But Jesus has now broken that power of sin. It's not your master. So you can now offer the parts of your body as instruments of righteousness. The reason I can't do what I want to do on the spot, even though I'm in Christ is because for years, my body has been trained to live like this world. My feet have been trained to stand in pride. My hands have been trained to control. My gut has been, has been trained to feast on the things of this world. My eyes have been trained to lust. My mouth has been trained to curse. My ears have been trained to listen to gossip. My mind has been trained to be anxious. My face has been trained to be judgmental or ashamed. And so we jump in the spot and think we're going to be able to do it different because we're now in Christ. No, just like you train to write right-handed or left-handed, you couldn't just today pick it up and do it, but you could start training and practicing because the world has trained me to have certain attitudes, habits, behaviors, perspectives. There's literally sin. We talked about this in season one, trapped in the parts of your body. Is this what it's saying? Because you've been trained to live like the world. Fasting is how I offer my whole body back to God to say, I am now training to be a person of righteousness. And I want everything from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head to be an instrument of righteousness. I am retraining my feet to walk by faith. I am retraining my hands to be servants. I am retraining my gut to crave the things of God. I'm retraining my eyes to look with love. I'm retraining my mouth to bless. I'm retraining my ears to listen to God's voice. I'm retraining my face to show the love of God to the world around me. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? And this is the practice of saying no to what I want so I can say yes to that which is good so my body can be used for the goodness and the glory of God. This is why he says... I urge you, brothers, I know this is a lot, right? Like I've been thinking about this all week. Um, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Like you have a sacred body. You are not a soul trapped in an evil body. God has given you a beautiful body and a beautiful soul. And this is the place he's empowered you to rule and reign. Like this is your kingdom, if you will. And fasting is like offering our whole body to God my whole self to seeking God, saying, God, I don't want any of my anything, my body, mind, soul, spirit. I don't want any of it to be of the world. I want it all to be of you. So I offer all of this to you, that this would become a holy temple of the Lord that it already is, but that it would function like that, a place of prayer, a place of awareness with you. I want to submit and surrender it all to you. And last one here, I humbled myself with fasting. There is this humility that takes place when we fast because it breaks our pride. It breaks our self-sufficiency. It breaks our control. And it reminds us that we are not sustained by this world, but by God himself. You with me on all that? Yes. So here's the question. When you fast, what happens? When you fast, what happens? For a lot of us, the answer is we get hangry. <laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? But that's what happens. We fast, we get hangry. And as we're fasting, we tell people we're just angry because we're fasting and we're hungry. No, the truth is anger is already inside of you. And just denying yourself some food for maybe one lunch brings it all to the surface. The resentment, the pride, the lust, the greed, the control, the judgment, the jealousy, the edginess, the resent, the sarcasm. We say, oh, it's because I'm fasting that I... No, it was already in there. Fasting just exposes what the God of your stomach really is. 
And, and it shows us a reality that maybe we don't want to see. That's why it's humbling. So here's your practice plan for this week. Fast and pray one day this week. Just try it. Just pick one day. One day where you're going to fast and you're going to pray. Fasting without prayer is just dieting. That's not what we're going for. <laughs> fasting and prayer is denying the flesh so I can walk in the spirit. If prayer is being aware of God, then I'm fasting from food to feast on God. Pick one day. Just pick one day. One day this week. And if you, if you have health challenges, whatever, don't, it's fine. You don't have to do it. Ask God for something else. But pick one day and pre-plan it the night before. Tell whoever's going to be impacted by it. Hey, I'm just practicing something in my own faith journey. <laughs> wow. Didn't see that coming. You're like, there's, there's a lot of hangry about to be coming out. So just... If you could be aware, I'm trying to, trying to kill that thing. <laughs> Give people a heads up and then try it. And then when you are hungry, turn your attention to God. And when you do get grumpy, become aware of how much of your life is revolved around the flesh. And when you do find yourself with a headache or struggling or irritable, whatever, acknowledge maybe my stomach is my God more than I realize and it's not really about food. The food is just showing me that I spend so much of my life satisfying the cravings of my flesh, which might be pride, greed, sexual immorality, lust, anger, control, judgment, whatever. It shows us so much more. And it shows us that there's so much more of God that he wants to give to us. Just try it. Just try it. And even if you can't do it, you say, I'm going to do it all day. And you make it to 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's it. That's all you can do. Great. When you eat, give thanks to God for that food and acknowledge God. Maybe my flesh is weaker than I even realize. I need your help to put even the first nail in because I can't get to even the third. I need you to actually help me here. He will so meet you there. When you have a heart desire to say, God, I want to feast on you. Come on. We can get focused on the flesh being weak, but we know that the spirit is willing. He wants to teach us to submit our flesh, our cravings, our compulsions, our desires to the spirit. He wants to help us crucify our flesh so we can truly be satisfied by him. So how do we go about that? Well, let's turn to our circles and talk about it.